I want to say welcome to this virtual worship gathering hosted by Eastgate Baptist Church. My name is Jerome Taylor. I have the privilege and honor of serving as the pastor here at Eastgate Baptist, and I'm thankful that we have this opportunity to share with you as the church online, not an online church, this is never to be a substitute, but an online extension of the church working to help connect one another with the message of the scriptures, helping one another celebrate who Jesus is and to help people grow in their faith. And, and we want to help people take that next step. So I'm thankful for this opportunity to do so. If you would like to find out more information about what we are doing to help people in that process, and maybe you are looking to take your next step, I'd invite you to go to eScapeBaptist.org and check out what's going on, how God is using His church in the Flint, Michigan area. Uh, you can certainly peruse around our social media and feel free to like, share, comment on this message and, and let others know what's going on through it. I also want to say thank you uh, for all those that helped make this ministry possible. Thank you for your continual giving and your generosity. It helps us to meet our obligations and, and help meet the needs of others in good faith and uh, helps us to provide resources that, that help people in their timely sense of need and urgency. And we're so grateful that you partner along with us. If you would like to give today and perhaps haven't before, you can give online or you can text GIVE to 810-202-8331. And so today, as I, we have met together and, and, and to focus in on this time together, I'm going to encourage you to lean in as we spend time in prayer, as we spend time praising God through song, as we spend time through the proclamation of His Word. And as we do that and prepare our hearts to lean in, it's always good to go to God in that conversation of prayer, that relationship that He invites us to, and to seek His will in this time. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I am so grateful for your church that, uh, that gathers in this way, that connects with who you are in this way. And while we are apart, I pray your grace would be extended incredibly upon them, that they would grow in their knowledge of you. They would grow in what it means to follow after you, and they would grow in what it means to help others see you as they serve them in word and deed. Lord, today you are worthy, just as you are worthy any other day, to receive honor and praise. Yours is the glory and the name above all names. And I pray that what we do in this time would express our heart of worship towards you. I'm thankful that, that you hear our prayers and that whenever we have sin and we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to cleanse us and forgive us of all unrighteousness. That, that is the beauty and the amazing grace that's found in your gospel. I also pray, and as we thank you, we, we remember that we are in such short supply at times. There are things beyond our control, beyond our capacity. And when we look to you, we're reminded that while these things may be bigger than our hands, they're not bigger than yours. And you are the God that invites us to come to you, to call to you, to pray to you, and that you are able in your immeasurable greatness, your mighty working of your strength to respond and meet those needs in your time, in your way, with your answer. And so, Lord, as we have this moment today, I just pray that you would help us to make the most of it, that our ears would be listening to your words, that our hearts would be engaged with your affections, that our eyes and our minds will be in tune to your wisdom, and that our hands and feet would be shifted towards your work. Lord, help us to grow in our knowledge of you today. Help those that are listening today that need to respond to the greatness of your gospel to respond. And we thank you for all of the privilege and hope that is found in you, Jesus. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me in worship today. Let's get started with a call to worship from Psalm 103. This is Psalm 103, verses 1 through 4. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Let's worship. Praise to you, 
the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Praise Him in glad adoration. your presence. We ask for you to be with us in this hard time, and in doing so, we acknowledge that it's only through the cross that we are able to call on you. So we thank you with the right standing that was bought on the cross, and forgive us when we misuse that gift, when we misuse that standing, to call on you only when we want something. Even though our attention is fleeting, Yours is not. Amen. Let's read it from Psalm 69, verse 16 through 18. Answer me, Lord, for your faithful love is good. Turn to me in your great compassion. Don't hide your face from me, your servant, because I'm in deep trouble. Answer me quickly. Come close to me. Redeem me. Oh, bless. 
flows from you. We know that everything good in the world comes from you. Everything good in our lives comes from you. You are our creator and our redeemer. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. We've now come to this moment of our worship gathering where we regularly spend time receiving the proclamation of the scriptures through the preaching of the word, through the teaching from the Bible. And I'm going to invite you to turn in your copy of the scriptures to the gospel of Luke, the gospel of Luke. And if you do not have a, a copy of the scriptures that you can regularly turn to, we want to help provide access to that and to get a copy into your hands. Uh, the one of the ways you can do that is by uh, commenting or messaging us or by texting B-I-B-L-E to 810-202-8331. And uh, we want to help get, get you access to a copy of the Scriptures. Our whole goal with this time of proclaiming the Word is for people to understand what it says, what it means, how it applies, and, and so they will learn what it means to trust in Jesus, to follow after Him as they listen to Him. And we believe that getting the scripture in people's hands and as they grow in their knowledge of God and follow after him, life transformation takes root as we follow Jesus together. And as we speak about following Jesus, we're going to be looking at the gospel of Luke. But over the course of the next several weeks, that, that's going to be our target. We're going to be looking at the four, first four 
books of the New Testament, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and the reason we're doing that is because we're going to be really taking in uh, the life of Jesus to understand more about who he is and, and why he came and, and, and what he did, where he went, when he lived, what he said, and see that these were not just some ransom, random occurrences in the, the life and scheme of history, but they were fulfilling of everything that was promised in the New Testament, I mean, in the Old Testament, when we look at why Jesus came, that the Gospels weren't just poof, dropped out of the sky but their significance in, in, in what is revealed and what it means for us to continue to follow this Jesus by seeing who he is. And I don't know, maybe you've had questions about Jesus. We're gonna be walking through his life and seeing what it means to know him, to hear from him, what he actually said and what he actually did. And, and I just encourage you to join with us as we read. You may be thinking, well, the Gospels, there's four of them. Why are there four? What, what is the purpose of those? And today we're going to be looking at that very topic, the purpose of the Gospels. And in the Gospel of Luke, we're going to see this introduction, this, this writing of why he did what he did, why he compiled what he compiled, why he recorded and reported what we are reading when we look at the Gospels. And they help give us a glimpse of, of the purposes of all four. They echo the purpose. And the purpose of the Gospels is that we, as followers of Jesus, we as proclaimers of Jesus, would be certain in the one in whom we have placed our faith. That, that there would be assurance in, in about who Jesus is and what he has accomplished as we learn what he says, as we see what it means, as we apply it to our lives, as we trust in him. So I'm going to invite you as you have turned in your copy of the scriptures to the Gospel of Luke chapter 1 verses 1 through 4. And here we're going to see this purpose laid out for us by the good Dr. Luke. We're going to see uh, the authority of the Gospels. He writes this, many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us. You see, the, the, the good doctor, the, the historian, Luke, is writing to us and, and sharing with us about the authority found in the Gospels, his Gospel that he's recording, but overall the entire message of the Gospels and that there's authority in them. And this authority has been witnessed, has been seen in the events that have been fulfilled among us, the events that have been fulfilled among us. And he says, many have undertaken to compile a narrative. Many have been trying to write down these, these moments and, and to deal with it. And, and, and this person may have this point and this snapshot and this snapshot, but he is Le being led to compile these uh, narratives. Why? Because they have authority. They, they have authority because they are the fulfillment of God's plans. That's why he says the events that have been fulfilled among us. These, these occurrences weren't random occurrences. They were God's providence at work. And Luke is being led by the Lord in, in, in the Lord's providence to, to reveal these for what they mean, to present why they have such great authority and strength over us. And this is awesome. This is good news for us as believers because we see then that the gospel, this good news is actually good. It is a gracious, unmerited gift God did not have to do it, but he chose and willingly did this, revealed this to us. And it's a glorious gift. It is immeasurable greatness. It is the mighty working of the strength of the Lord on display. And when we have the gospels that are not merely this is passing information, it is a revelation of, of God's authoritative work among men to fulfill all that he promised he provided in Jesus. And as it's a gift, it's been provided to us so that we would have the provision of a biblical faith. 
that when we look at Jesus, the events that have been fulfilled among the, the eyewitnesses there, we would see that everything done was done in the context of Scripture. It was no random occurrence. It wasn't just a happenstance stage. It was Jesus coming and fulfilling that which he had the authority to fulfill, that which he had the authority to accomplish. And, and it provides us with the roots for a biblical faith. When we see that these were not just some random occurrences, it lets us know that this biblical faith, that it, it's true, it's all of it is authoritative and powerful for our life because we see it's not some random mix of occurrences. It's God fulfilling that which He promised. And He gives us assurance in the, uh, of why the Scripture is so good. We see it providing us a historical faith. This is not Luke saying these things, ah, they happened, let me make up a story that sounds cattywampus and weird and, and really mystical and extravagant. No, he's speaking about things that happened in the actual history of man. The Bible is so amazing in how it is given to us, not as some legend as other myths that are out there, but that happened in the context of history. You can go to these places. You can read about these other leaders that were in charge. These were not made up figures. These were not imaginary beings. Jesus' life was accomplished and authoritative in the middle of history. And we're meant to, to go there and see that everything the Scripture reveals is in line with what history has taught us. That Jesus was an actual person, a factual being, a historical figure that walked among other historical figures. And we're going to be able to look in the when and where of Jesus' life. The gospel is a gift because it helps us to see that it's got a foundation that provides us a biblical faith. Everything is done in the context and the fullness of Scripture. Everything is happening in the course of human events. And in the middle of history, God is working in the life of man and pointing us back to when these things actually happened. And, and because of it, it provides us a verifiable faith. As, as Luke is saying this, he's saying many people, there have been many witnesses that have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, not beyond us, not sometime long, long ago, but in the day in which we lived. The Gospels were written in that first generation. They're unique among other works of antiquity. There's many written sometimes decades, sometimes hundreds of years from their historical moment through research. This was written in the lifetime so that these eyewitnesses could provide that verifiable account, so that the that, that church that witnessed the, the life and the, and the death and, and the resurrection of Jesus, they could be gone to and, and verify that these things, they did happen. And they weren't some corroborated circumstance. They went along with everything the Bible said was true. They went along with everything that was going on in history. They went along with the movement and the, and the verifying nature of eyewitnesses saying, this happened among us. We are witnesses of these things. It's seeking to provide that certainty of us, that there's authority in the Gospels. Luke then goes on to say that just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. He is compiling this narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us. And these were not random strangers that are sharing about these, these details. These are the original eyewitnesses. These are the apostles that walked with Jesus, that ate where he ate and, and, and slept where he slept and, and walked where he walked and, and, and talked to those he talked to and witnessed the miracles. These are the original eyewitnesses. And, and Luke is compiling this not as some third-party hearsay, but as those that lived and walked in the moment. The original eyewitnesses. 
the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word that was handed down to them. These eyewitnesses, these followers of Jesus recognized that the Lord God had handed them and trusted them with the word. The, the profound nature, the, the verifiable goodness that was found in the scriptures. And he handed it down to them and entrusted it to them. So here's what this is going to share with us. That this was entrusted to them. And they would see the authority found in, in who Jesus was and what Jesus did and what Jesus said and why Jesus accomplished what he did, when and where, all those details. They're going to see the authority of it and, and they're going to understand the authenticity that, that this was no mere man. This was the Son of God, the Messiah, the King. This was the, the one who was divinely humble. And yet perfectly human, fully God, fully man, the word that became flesh. And he had entrusted them with his word and they were faithful servants, servants to pass it down. What does that reveal to us today? That as we have been entrusted with the authority found in scriptures and the potency, the authenticity uh, of seeing who Jesus is with, with our own eyes and, and, and walking alongside him, following him, it's our task to be servants of the word to help share it with others. Just as Luke is saying it was shared with him. We are to share it with others. We see not only the authority and the authenticity, but we see the authorship of the Gospels. Luke writes and says, so it seemed also seemed good to me since I have carefully investigated everything from the very first to write to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus. You see the authorship of the Gospels, that these four Gospels are written by four unique perspectives. You have Matthew as he is being led by the Holy Spirit and moved by the providential hand, strong hand of the Lord. He is compiling an account of how Jesus is the very fulfillment of the Messiah. That everything that the Old Testament was speaking about, this coming one that would be the, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the wonderful counsel, the Prince of Peace, the suffering servant, the one who is a prophet like Moses, the one who, like, who, who was the fulfillment of Abraham's promise that all the nations of the world would be blessed through him. He is seeking to present this. He is led to present it to a, a, a largely Hebrew audience so they could see the fulfillment of all these prophecies. And they're writing them. You see Mark, as he's accounting and, and, and speaking about uh, what it means to know Jesus as the active, uh, working in his power, son of God, demonstrating miracles and being among the people. You see him sharing what it means to to a Gentile world that this Jesus is fully able to save. You see Luke writing here, and, and he is going to do the undertaking of showing how Jesus was humble in his divinity. He was fully God and yet perfectly humble. And yet he was sinless and perfectly human, coming to serve man coming to teach us. There's some unique details in Luke that we don't find in the other Gospels because he's seeking to compile his research so that we may have certainty that Jesus was fully divine, fully human. And we see John pointing us to the signs that Jesus accomplished by his power, by pointing us to the sayings of Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection. We see John being led by the Lord to show that he is the eternal, incomparable, incarnate one. The one who was the word that became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The one 
full of grace and truth, the one in whom eternal life is made available. You see, Luke writes here, it seemed good to me. Since he had carefully investigated everything, since he had done this, he wasn't doing it so to be fruitless. It was potent in his life, but he didn't want to hoard it. He wanted to give it to others. And so he begins putting this down in an orderly sequence. This is how the scriptures are given to us. They're given and provided in an orderly sequence. This is how they're revealed. Uh, we see in the Gospels a chronological order that, that helps us to see how this works in the history of man. We see it in a, in a geographical order as we walk with Jesus in the places where he walked, in places you can actually even go to today. We see it in the dramatic order where Jesus is letting drama unfold. And you see that it's building up to fully reveal the theological order. That once again, these were not just random occurrences. They were the narrative history, the foundation for which we can see that the promise is now provided. That the power and presence of Jesus is made known. That the gospel is made available. It is gifted to us. So we may have assurance, we may have certainty in the one in whom we have believed. This is why we have the Gospels. This is the purpose. And we see that it's directed towards an audience. That's a part of the, the purpose of the Gospels, not only the authority found in them, not only the authenticity of, of how it's the, the revelation of God made known to man and entrusted to us, and not only is it the authorship that God is using these men in their research to help other people grow, it is directed at someone. And that someone is you and I. Even today, there may be some that listen to this this video, they're engaged with this process because God is leading them to know that you are His audience. Not for entertainment's sake, not for merely encouragement's sake, not even for an enlightenment's sake. Yes, the Bible is very entertaining. It's engaging. Yes, the Bible gives us incredible comfort. It is encouraging. Yes, the Bible grows us in wisdom as we learn about the time and place of these events, it is enlightenment. But more than anything, it is life transformation as we grow in following Jesus. Luke says he's writing this to the most honorable Theophilus. It could be that Theophilus was, was Luke's benefactor. Maybe he's uh, helping him to compile these, helping him provide the tools necessary to, to have this sequence account. You know, uh, having those resources was, was not a cheap uh, endeavor in those days. And compiling them, it's, un it's unique that we see that the word Theophilus means God lover. And even though we see Luke is writing to what we believe is an actual person, he's actually also writing to us. Those who love God because he first loved us. That is why we love God. It's, we didn't just come up with the idea. We love because He first loved us. Because He, in His loving order, revealed the gospel, the good news to us, that, that demonstrates His grace towards us who were undeserving. That demonstrates His glory in providing a gift that is amazing and incredible. Eternal life with Him. A life transformed. But He does it so that we have a purpose. The Bible is not given so that we would have a flimsy, fickle faith. It is given to us so that we may have and we may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. If we're going to be like the most honorable Theophilus, the most honorable God lovers, then we must grow in our knowledge of who God is and know with certainty these things of which we've been instructed. We must take time to let this instruction take root in our life as we see the life of Jesus, who He is, what He has accomplished, why He did what He did, where He walked, when He lived, what were the circumstances, what was He saying, and why it all matters. We must 
take the time to be instructed by the Scripture, to be shaped and transformed by it. But we also must understand the importance of it. That just as Luke, he saw it seem good, since I have carefully instructed everything from the very first, to write to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus, so that you may know. We also, as we have carefully been instructed and we carefully investigate, we must be most honorable God lovers to share it with others. That the purpose of the gospel gives us the certainty in whom we have believed, the certainty of Christ, so that we may also share Christ. That in our audiences that we come across, we let them know that this is not just about entertainment value. This is not just about encouragement. This is not just about enlightenment, but it's about our souls. That the gospel reveals to us the very nature and character of God who is holy and righteous in all he does, who is a keeper of all his promises, those that are good and plentiful, and those that are righteous and just. And being that he keeps all of his promises in good faith, we must understand that the offense of our sin is deserving of his righteous and just indignation towards our sin, our rebellion against him. But because of who he is, the sufficiency of Christ shows his goodness. And instead of pouring out his his justice and righteousness upon us in a way that we would feel his wrath, he takes it upon himself so that all who personally respond to him as every single person must do, no one can do it for them. They might receive grace in their time of need. They may see the glory found in Jesus Christ, that their heart would be awakened and they would repent and respond in faith personally. And their life would never be the same. It would be forever changed. That one day when when Jesus calls us home, we will go to an eternal dwelling with him. Because the Lord not only saves, but he supplies and he sustains and he sanctifies. He changes us through and through and he keeps us and preserves us as we follow after him. And as we are growing in, in the knowledge and instruction of the Lord, our life is being transformed by this gospel in which we have come to believe. And grow in our certainty of it so that we may also share it with others so they may believe and grow in the certainty of it and share it. The gospel is beautiful in its provision. It shows us the authority of God who gave us such a gift. It shows us the authenticity of his love and declaration towards us by making this happen in human history. It shows us the authorship that has been and trusted to place this and pen this so that we might have it accessible to us today. And it shows that we are to be an audience who carries this to an audience. This is the work of God done through the Gospels to reveal His grace towards man, His glory for all eternity, and the goodness that is found in the Lord God Almighty, in Jesus Christ. I want to invite you and encourage you to Walk with me as we journey through the scriptures to see what it means to follow Jesus. And if we can help you take that next step of faith to place your trust and faith in Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you may have questions about that, we want to help you to take that next step. You can reach out to us, comment, message, uh, email us through connect at eastgatebaptist.org, and we would love to help you take your next step. But as we pray about where God would lead us, Let us pray together in this close. Lord Jesus, I am so grateful for your kindness towards us. I pray that you would help us to grow in the grace and knowledge, the great grace and knowledge found in in you. And I pray that this would be fruitful, it would be meaningful, and it would multiply and overflow from our lives, not only in how we follow Jesus with our words and deeds, but we would carry the name of Jesus, to the places and the people that need to know His grace, that need to see His glory, that need to experience the gift of the Gospels. 
Thank you for the beauty and the power found in them. Thank you that it is Jesus that we claim and embrace. Thank you for the certainty that's found in his name, the name which we pray this prayer. Amen. May God bless you as you seek to follow Jesus, and I pray that we can help you walk in these next steps.